Thank you so much for inviting me to give this lecture today. And thank you to Alicia especially for organising this fantastic exhibition. I'm truly sorry that I am unable to give this lecture in person, as I had hoped, but I am incredibly happy that the power of modern technology has allowed us to host it virtually instead. My name is Helen Hilliard and I am the curator at Dulwich Picture Gallery London, where I am a specialist in Dutch and Flemish painting of the 17th century. And I am working in exactly the right place because even though Dulwich is a relatively small museum, we are fortunate to have an exceptional collection of over 200 paintings from this period. This includes pictures by the great masters of Dutch painting, namely Peter Paul Rubens, Anthony van Dyck, David Tenniers the Younger, Peter Lely, Rembrandt van Rijn and Albert Kaup, to name a few. The core of this collection was assembled by the gallery's founders, the art dealer Noel Desenfant, his wife Margaret and the painter Francis Bourgeois. Famously, the gallery has very strong ties to Poland, as the buying of paintings for the Dulwich collection was initially started under the direction of Stanisław August Poniatowski, King of Poland, for the benefit of his own collection in Warsaw. However, after the partition of Poland and Poniatowski's abdication, the founders decided to create their own gallery in South London. But my lecture today covers an entirely different topic. I want to explore the concept of genre in Dutch painting. The term genre is used to describe the different types of subject matter present in 17th century Dutch painting. Portraiture, landscape, still life are all examples of genre categories. For me, this is such an important topic because it is genre and the diversity of subjects in Dutch painting that makes it so unique and which truly sets it apart from Italian, French or Spanish painting in the same period. There are countless different genres in Dutch paintings. Some you will probably be more familiar with, like these, whereas others are slightly more unusual. And there are many more in addition to those listed here. If you had travelled to the Low Countries in, say, the 1640s, you would have been able to find artists who specialised in all of these different subjects. Whereas if you had travelled to Rome to try to find someone who could write your name with insects or paint a portrait of your favourite cow, you almost certainly would have come back empty handed. But what was it about the Northern Netherlands that created this plentiful and extraordinarily diverse art market? To discover the answer, we need to delve into the history of the Dutch Republic. At the end of the 16th century, the Northern Netherlands revolted against their Habsburg Spanish rulers to establish their own independent nation, the United Provinces of the Netherlands more commonly referred to as the Dutch Republic. This was a long and bloody revolt, but from it, this young and ambitious country gained both religious and economic freedom, making Protestantism rather than Catholicism the dominant religion and freeing themselves from the heavy taxation of the Spanish. Both of these elements were key ingredients in the melting pot that was the Dutch art market. In Southern Europe, the church was the primary source of art patronage, providing commissions for altarpieces, sculpture and private chapels. By contrast, the Protestant church, especially in its strictest forms of Calvinism, rejected images completely. In fact, images of Protestant churches from this time are often shown whitewashed, with all iconography and decoration removed. 
Because of this, artists were forced to find alternative outlets for their art. At the same time, Holland emerged as the new economic hub of Europe. We see the growth of a new middle class, one that aspires to be cultured and cultivated, one that is eager to buy art. In this context, artists have access to a much wider market. No longer is an artist's career dependent upon patronage from the aristocracy or religious institutions. And while they can still work to commission, and often they do do so, for the first time, they are also able to produce art for the market without having a specific buyer in mind. However, as demand increases, so does the amount of work being produced. The market becomes increasingly crowded as artists see the new opportunities suddenly available to them and opening up to their careers. This is especially true of the city of Amsterdam, which artists from across the Netherlands flock to like moths to a flame. So, if you're a young artist competing against a hundred other artists just like you, how do you make yourself stand out? How do you put yourself to the front of the crowd? The answer, you specialise specialize, specialize. In this time, we see a dramatic rise in different genres of painting, as artists attempt to carve out increasingly niche specialist areas. I'm going to explore some of these genres in my lecture through a series of what I'm calling ambassador works, that is works that can be taken as representatives for their genre. The majority of these examples come either from the collection at Dulwich Picture Gallery in London or here at the Royal Castle Museum in Warsaw. I'm going to talk through how these subjects developed as well as their unique qualities. And the genre I'm going to start with is portraiture. For portraiture, the ambassador work that I am using is Rembrandt van Rijn's portrait of Jacob de Heijn III from Dulwich Picture Gallery. Now, portraiture was a genre that had existed long before the 17th century, but what changes in the context of the Dutch Republic is the people who are being depicted. Previously, portraiture was the preserve of kings, queens and the aristocracy. But now we see a broad middle class who are looking to emulate that tradition. Rembrandt, one of the most famous painters of this time, began his career as a portrait painter. When he moved to Amsterdam in 1631, it was to work in the workshop of the art dealer Hendrik van Eulenburg which was effectively a factory for portrait production. Through Hendrik, Rembrandt met his first wife, Hendrik's niece, Saskia. And at this time, the average price for a portrait by Rembrandt was around 340 guilders. And even after he left Eulenburg studio, portrait commissions continued to provide a stable and constant source of income throughout Rembrandt's life. Here, Rembrandt has depicted Jacob de Heijn III, an engraver who himself was the son of the famed printmaker, Jacob de Heijn II. This painting also has a companion in the portrait of Maritz Hauhens, today in the collection of the Kunsthalle in Hamburg. Hauhens was a secretary to the Dutch Council of State and was also a close friend of de Heijn, so it's a lovely pair of friendship portraits. Now, the painting of de Heijn is representative of Rembrandt's early style. When he was still young and had only very recently left his hometown of Leiden for Amsterdam. Rembrandt has depicted this gentleman with exquisite attention to detail, 
from the fine golden threads of his hair to the folds of his lace ruff. It is painted in with what is known as the fine shielder technique or fine painting technique, which was incredibly popular with collectors at this time and is in complete contrast to the much broadly painted works of Rembrandt's later years. For example, if we compare the portrait of Jacob de Haine to this work, Rembrandt's portrait of a young man, possibly the artist's son Titus, which was painted in the very final years of Rembrandt's life. Yet, for the great artist that Rembrandt considered himself to be, there was no real prestige in portrait painting alone. For him, the greatest artistic achievement was to be found in history painting, that is, works depicting important and noble episodes from the Bible or from mythology. This is what Rembrandt really wanted to be doing. And tellingly, in a painting like The Night Watch, Rembrandt applies the scale, composition and grandeur of history painting to a group portrait. The idea of a group portrait, a work depicting multiple individuals, is also something distinctly Dutch. The Night Watch depicts a civic militia company for District 2. There were 80 members of the company and they paid on average 100 guilders to have their portrait included in this painting, with each one paying more or less depending on where they were. If you were front and centre, that would have cost more. Whereas, if you were just ahead in the background, you could get away with paying slightly less. What is incredible about the Night Watch is the way Rembrandt elevates his painting above other portraits of the period. The artist creates a sense of narrative and drama in the painting, telling us the story of these figures as they prepare to go to war. In reality, none of these men would have ever fought in battle. The primary purpose of the militia was to protect the city from enemy invasion, but this was never a situation that these men ever had to face. In fact, they were more like a glorified drinking society. Nevertheless, Rembrandt still manages to, manages to present them as heroes of the Dutch Republic. Our ambassador work for landscape is Jan Both's Road by the Edge of a Lake from Dulwich Pitch Gallery, which appears in the current exhibition at the Royal Castle Museum. This painting depicts a warm summer's evening with a sky that is coloured by beautiful hues of pink, blue and yellow. It's a very relaxing and peaceful scene with figures slowly making their way along the water's edge. The origins of the landscape genre began well before the 17th century. However, generally, where landscape appeared, it was a minor event, acting as a background to portraits or religious subjects, as in this painting. It was in the 16th century Netherlands that artists like Peter Bruegel the Elder started to develop the concept of landscape still using it as a background for biblical stories, but making it much more of a dominant element. By the next century, landscape had become a legitimate subject in its own right. Coming back to Jan Both's Road by the Edge of a Lake, for those of you who have been to the Netherlands, you will know that it looks nothing like this. Both's image was inspired not by the Dutch countryside, but by Italy. The artist was one of a group of painters known as the Dutch Italianates, who were influenced by the light and landscapes of the Mediterranean, combining them with Dutch subjects in order to create idyllic pastoral scenes. Both was one of the few painters who actually travelled to the southern Europe himself. For most of the Dutch Italianates, Both's works were actually the closest they ever got to Italy. It's very unlikely, however, that Both has depicted a real location, 
Most of these Dutch Italianate paintings are contrived scenes carefully designed to lead the viewer's eye around the painting. Another example from the Dutch collection which does precisely this is Road by a River by the Dordrecht painter Albert Kaup. There, the road and the pointing girl lead us to the left edge of the painting before we are pushed back up by the branch of the tree up to the mountain and down the river again. So it's all carefully contrived to lead the viewer's eye around each corner of the painting. Only in the Dutch Republic could Both have produced a painting like Road by the Edge of a Lake for the open market without having a specific buyer in mind, comfortable in the knowledge that he would be able to sell it nonetheless. And this type of work was hugely popular with the urban middle classes. If you were in busy, rainy Amsterdam, a work like this would undoubtedly have provided you with a sense of freedom and escapism. But even within the genre of landscape, this category can still be divided further. Whilst both Both and his peers, like Kaup, specialise in these Italianate, Mediterranean-inspired landscapes, artists like Mindert Hobbema and Jakob van Rysdale specialised in more realistic depictions of the Dutch landscape, although these were often just as contrived as those Mediterranean scenes and constructed from different elements of landscape all patched together into one picture. There were also further unique specialisms within this landscape genre, such as dune paintings, nocturnal scenes, and lightning landscapes. There are also further derivatives like seascapes, urban views, and architectural painting. From inventories of the period, we know that these were all named as individual subject categories, and that there was a ready market for all of them. Our ambassador for the still life genre is the castle's very own Still Life with Dead Game by Melchior de Hontecorza. The centre of this composition is a dead hare strung up by its legs. There is also a dead pheasant as well as much smaller birds. We see perhaps a nut, a nut hatch and maybe a goldfinch. We also see hunting implements, including a game bag. Now, it's an image that on the surface might appear quite graphic and quite violent. There's a real visceral quality to it. So it does beg the question, why would a collector want to own a painting like this? Much like landscape, still life also had its origins in the 16th century, but it was usually an add-on within portraits or religious subjects, as we see here in this depiction of the Holy Family. It's at the end of the 16th century that we see paintings like those by the artist Joachim Buchler, which, although they do present religious scenes, focus clearly on the still life elements. In this painting, you'd be forgiven for missing the biblical story, story entirely, that you can just about see painted in comparatively small scale in the background. We see Mary going over the bridge with Joseph on their way to Bethlehem. It's in paintings like this that we see the development of still life subjects as a distinct genre in their own right. But again, there are a wide variety of specialist subjects within this, and artists who specialise in every single one of them. We have table still lives, flower still lives, insect paintings, and dead game scenes like the one Hontekota produced. Some of these subjects responded to popular pastimes and fashions during the period. For example, hunting, or in the case of flower still lives, the increased interest in botany and new flower species imported from the New World. 
But for many of these paintings, there is also a deeper meaning beyond their surface. These images could also act as memento mori, a term that literally translates as, remember that you will die. Quite simply, they are meant to remind the viewer of their own mortality. In cases like Hondrakota's scene of the game, this reference is obvious, but in scenes of fruits and flowers, the viewer is meant to think about how these different elements will all rot and decay with time. For a Dutch Calvinist audience, and we have to put ourselves in that mindset, these paintings were a strong reminder that all life on earth is fleeting and thus these images were a perfect way of combining both an image of incredible beauty with a moralizing lesson. For our next category, genre painting, I have taken another work from the castle's collection. A Smoker and a Drunkard by Adrian van Ostade. As well as described in the different categories of painting in the Northern Netherlands, the term genre can also be used to describe scenes depicting everyday life. And here we see precisely such a scene. The focus is a man in a blue jacket holding a tobacco pipe. He has a distinctive and characterful face with a furrowed brow, as if he is trying to focus, but is maybe a bit too drunk to remember why he's there or what he's meant to be doing. In the darkness, we see another figure holding a tankard of beer. His face is equally expressive. Astada was one of the great genre painters of the 17th century, and it is tempting to imagine that these two are regulars from the artist's local tavern and that he's painted a scene really typical of any Friday night down the pub. The roots of genre painting lie once again in the previous century and it's once again also Peter Bruegel the Elder who really led the way in the construction of the genre. In paintings like The Wedding Dance in the collection of the Detroit Museum of Arts or The Wedding Feast, which is today at the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, we see an interest depicting, we see an interest in depicting not only the aristocracy, but the lives of regular people. It's in these paintings that for the first time we see an artist interested in realistically and accurately depicting traditional village customs. These paintings are lively, energetic and unsentimental. According to the 17th century art historian Carol van Manda, in painting these works, Bruegel was returning to his own peasant roots. Van Manda describes Bruegel as being picked out in an obscure village amidst the peasants and stimulated by nature to copy them with a brush. Vermander goes on to relate how Bruegel was essentially the first wedding crasher, that he dressed in peasants' costume and left his house in the city to scour village festivals, fairs and weddings with his friends, bringing presents and pretending to be family or acquaintances of the bride or bridegroom. Bruegel's paintings undoubtedly provide the foundation for works by artists like Adrian van Estrada, but also Adrian Brouwer and Jan Steen in the following century. Coming back to Estrada's painting, we can also think about how paintings like this reflected wider trends in 17th century society. Smoking, for example, was actually a relatively new pastime in the Netherlands. Tobacco was only imported from the New World at the end of the 16th century. It was in the 1620s that farmers in Zeeland and around Amersfoort began growing the plant and in the following decade Amsterdam emerged as one of the major tobacco centres of Europe. So, in a relatively short period of time, 
the Dutch Republic went from being a country of non-smokers to being the tobacophiles of Europe. Smoking itself became a habit associated with the masses and the poor in particular, even if they weren't the only ones smoking. Smoking was usually identified with socially suspect groups such as peasants, soldiers and sailors, and by extension was also usually associated with raucous and unruly behaviour. But as with other categories, genre painting takes many different forms. Paintings depicting peasant life are often referred to as low-life genre painting. In contrast, at the other end of the spectrum, we also have high-life genre painting. These are the type of scenes that we commonly associate with artists like Vermeer, such as the Rijksmuseum's Woman Reading a Letter, or with Herrit Dow's Woman with a Clavichord from the Dutch Pitch Gallery. These are scenes that show elegantly dressed men and women at leisure within their homes. Often the differences in these two types of scenes are also reflected in the techniques with which they are painted. High life scenes are often painted with much more fine and greater precision, whereas low life scenes are painted much more broadly with heavier brushwork and much more muted colours. Vermeer is one of the few exceptions to this rule. Since he created scenes using broadly applied patches of colour, but which still managed to appear refined to the naked eye. As with still lives, there is also often a deeper meaning to these paintings than first meets the eye. According to some art historians, some of these images contain a moralising message, an instruction for the viewer as to how and to how, how not to behave. Sometimes what this message is, is very clear, as in Jan Steen's The Effects of Intemperance, where the mother of household has drunk too much and has fallen asleep, and the children and servants and animals are all now running wild since she's not paying attention. However, in other paintings, including that by Ostada, whether they are actually intended to be moralising is much more open to debate and is much more ambiguous. Discussing Dutch paintings according to genre can make this period of art history feel very ordered and logical. But of course, in reality, it's still very messy. And there are a number of works that don't fit easily into any one category or genre. Sometimes we can consider these works as hybrids. That is works that combine different aspects of different genres. Take, for example, this portrait by the artist Adrian van der Velde from the collection of the Rijksmuseum. It shows a family portrait, although we don't know the identity of the family exactly, but they are shown within the context of a Dutch landscape. So he's combining both portrait and landscape into one image. In doing so, an image like this offers both the escape of the countryside whilst also emphasising the wealth and status of this family as landowners. In some instances, artists would also combine their talents with those of another specialist. You know, if, if people have these really refined specialisms, often they are only able to paint certain things. So if you want to complete a painting where an entirely different skill set is required, as in this genre scene, uh, which was painted by the architectural painter Bartolomeus van Bassen, he's had to join forces with the figure painter Assize van der Velde in order to make his scene feel populated and lively. Another example of this hybrid type is the Royal uh, Castle's own Girl in a Picture Frame by Rembrandt van Rijn, which is undoubtedly 
my favourite painting from this collection. At face value, this work might appear to be a portrait, but as many of you will know, it's nothing of the sort. This work falls somewhere in between portrait, genre painting and biblical painting. As the girl is dressed in a similar costume to that of Rembrandt's Old Testament heroines. This type of fantasy portrait is most commonly known as a tronie, a type of head study that Rembrandt specialised in. In contrast to Rembrandt's more formal portraits, like that of Jakob de Heyn, Tronies offered the possibility for experimentation, be it in terms of expression, lighting and costumes. Here the artist could explore a variety of different approaches and I would suggest that it's in the Tronies uh, that we see Rembrandt at his most creative, pushing the limits of his artistic practice. In my final section of my lecture, I'm going to end by drawing all of these different genres together to consider who would have collected them and how exactly they would have been displayed. If you were a collector of paintings, you'd likely have built a collection including examples of paintings from all of these different genres. Having works by each of these specialist painters allowed you to show off and to compete with your friends. In a similar way to the cabinets of curiosities that had developed in the century before, having an art collection was about both how many paintings you owned, as well as the sheer variety of your collection. Also, as a place for your personal enjoyment, you would want somewhere that you could visit on multiple occasions without ever tiring of it with the possibility to find something new in a painting each time you visited. You are able to get a sense of how these paintings might have been displayed if you visit the Rembrandt House Museum in Amsterdam, where they have cleverly recreated the entrance hall on the ground floor of the artist's house. This would have been where Rembrandt received guests, entertained friends, and as such was one of the more public facing areas of his house. It is significant that Rembrandt also owned a cabinet of curiosities filled with wonderful and unusual subjects and we can view his art collection within his broader collecting habits. He was a bit of a magpie and he just liked to collect bits of everything but unfortunately it didn't do his bank balance any favours. We also see the Dutch nobility amassing collections of art. For example, the Stadtholder Frederick Hendrik commissioned works by leading contemporary painters, including Rembrandt van Rijn, under the guidance of the philosopher and poet Constantine Huygens. We have to remember that the United Provinces were a young country without the sort of well-established royal collection that would have existed in other areas of Europe. In this context, it was important to cultivate a rich and diverse collection comparable to any of the great courts, and this, as such, was a vital tool in nation building. I hope that with this lecture, I have given you some insight into the rich variety of subject matter integral to Dutch painting in this period and that I have provided you with a different lens through which to explore these pictures. As I highlighted at the start of my lecture, for me, the concept of genre is precisely what makes Dutch art so special and truly sets it apart from other art of the period. Moreover, it is the level of competition that resulted from these competing genres and artists, which acted as a sort of furnace, which in turn forged some of the greatest painters and greatest artworks of all time. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.